Well, good morning to all of you. Um, we're dealing with a hot topic. It's probably even hotter than the weather we've been experiences, experiencing 100 plus degrees. Um, people love debates. I have the word debate in there. It can be used in a proper way that it's part of a search for truth. Truth in the natural world and truth in the world of scripture. And we certainly, as uh, members of God's church, we are fully, fully dedicated to truth. So I'm going to have some preliminary uh, things, and then we'll need slide one. Um, the title is Fossil Forest, Two Sides of the Debate. I'd like to suggest that there are two sides. Now, what I've published, as Dr. Gee mentioned, is in two different journals, creation journals, peer-reviewed, and so at least I've passed the muster there. But as you know, peer-reviewed doesn't mean it's absolute truth, <laughs> and that's why we can have a debate. So, And I welcome uh, opposing ideas. Next week, I hope you come back because I'm going to deal with the evidence that these fossil forests have been washed in, transported in. Today, I hope you're not disappointed. I'm going to present the best evidence I can find that some of the fossil forests have grown in place. And then we can compare the two. Um, how did I get interested in this? It was thanks to a member of the Geoscience Research Institute, which is housed just across the street. By the way, after we're done, go across the street. You won't get in the building, but right in front of the building is a nice tall fossil log from somewhere in Oregon. I would guess it's probably uh, uh, Cenozoic, Middle Cenozoic, maybe um, John Day Formation or one of those formations in Oregon. So you can actually have a visible picture of a upright fossil tree. It looks like it was dug out as it was upright. And we're going to deal with upright trees today. Um, so how did I get interested? In 1969, I took a class from Dr. Harold Coffin, as I just mentioned. He was in the process of writing this book, Creation, Accident, or Design. It was a class in the seminary at Andrews University. We had about 20 or 30 students, science and religion. Um, his book wasn't ready for the students, so he went to the press and they sent galley proofs. So I was able to read the book before I actually saw the light of day, uh, and I was very impressed. It created me a desire to study paleobotany the subject of old, ancient, however old is a relative term. As I'm getting older, I always say it's relative. <laughs> but uh, old uh, plants, study of old plants, fossil, paleobotany. Um, he was fresh out of Yellowstone National Park, and he had already done studies there, and you'll find it in the first edition of his book. It's gone through... Two more editions, um, one just in the last decade and a half or so, highly recommended. So you should get this book to get the insight of how to explain fossil forests through a worldwide catastrophic event. So um, after I uh, pastored for a while, I enrolled in Geology, Michigan State University, and paleobotany. And during my summer field uh, experience in Colorado, I found this stump of a tree. It's a fossil stump from um, probably Pleistocene, fairly recent. And uh, a tree growing upright. That was my first fossil tree I'd ever found. So I was excited, and here I can continue the excitement that Dr. Coffin had uh, conveyed to me 
uh, in that class. So we're ready for slide one, and we'll move ahead. I have about 30 slides. We're going to travel to six different places in the world with fossil forests. Um, next week, we're going to cover um, this. Uh, we're going to look at this tree, which is from fluorescent, fluorescent National Park, Florissant, uh, Colorado. And some of you I know have been there. Dr. Yin, you've probably been there once. We had a geoscience trip there once. And so I won't be dealing with this site and look at the size of this stump. We've had Dr. Mike Ark come in and talk about some of these stumps from fluorescent as well as Yellowstone, so I won't duplicate what he had covered. Now, if my computer works uh, correctly, we can um, advance forward. I always like to at least give the impression I'm well organized. <laughs> I'm not always. And here's my outline. First, I'd like to just discuss in about two minutes or less a philosophy of science and religion. See, if we don't lay a proper groundwork for dealing with these issues and providing harmony, we can get off track very quickly. Secondly, our first fossil forest will be in China. A lot of really neat stuff is coming out of China. Not just dinosaurs, not just dinosaur eggs and nests, but a lot of fossil forests in China. And they just reported on the one of the oldest fossil forests uh, recently found in China. So there's digging up new things all the time. And then we're going to our old, own petrified forest national park, Arizona. And then we're going to southern Indiana. Some I see here have been to southern Indiana, to this isolated quarry where you have some tidal cycles. Next we'll go to South America, uh, a fossil forest with the tree called Caristosperm, whatever that means. <laughs> and then we're going to China again, to Mongolia part of China, for the Suhent fossil forest. And finally, we're going to end up in Germany. So we're jumping around the globe, and we're also jumping up and down the geological column, and I'll talk about that very briefly in a minute. Um, our philosophy, Bible-based believers, can we have a philosophy where we can give all the honor that science should get and certainly all the honor that scripture should get? Well, we have some challenges. One challenge is, is that science is a book without a text. You know, it's like looking at a TV screen. You don't have sound. You don't have... Um, script below the picture. You just have a picture. Religion, which is the Bible, uh, doesn't have pictures, but science, um, or yeah, doesn't have pictures, and it has only text, written part. And so how do you match pictures with text? And you're going to be on much stronger basis if you can put the two together correctly. So that's a challenge. And that is the greatest challenge, one of the greatest challenges we face because if we're just off a little bit in creating the pictures that scripture provides, we're going to misinterpret science and vice versa. Einstein has said science without religion is lame, but religion without science is blind. Now, if you have a choice of those two, would you rather be lame or blind the rest of your life? Think about that for a minute. Would you rather be lame or blind? Well, you know the human inclination is, well, I can hobble around if I'm lame. But if I'm blind, I'm going to be bumping into things and be a lot harder. And that's what happens with modern science. People say, seeing is believing. And I can see it. I can see a fossil. I can see of rock formation, but there are some things I can't see, so I'd rather go with science. And that's, that's the naive approach 
that we see all the time. Another challenge is our own human mind, the limits. Let's face it, all of us are limited. Uh, first is the challenge that we're not always able to think even two-dimensionally. You know, we're not maybe very good at spatial relations. Just ask those that get lost trying to go into Los Angeles and back. You know, we get off track and that's a two-dimensional problem. But even harder, it's uh, more difficult to think three-dimensionally. So you add the surface and then you go subsurface and you have rock formations piled up subsurface and you've got to think about them as three-dimensional units and not two. But let me suggest fourth-dimensional thinking is by far the high, hardest. What do we mean by fourth dimension? Some of you have studied Einstein and physics. What's the fourth dimension? Time. I think I heard that. Time, according to Sir, uh, according to Albert Einstein, is the fourth dimension and explains space. And you cannot fully understand space without understanding time. Well, the same way with geology. You don't fully understand the rock record unless you can have a time sequence and unless you can recreate some kind of time going from cause to effect, cause to effect as you go up the geological column. That is by far the hardest challenge and it's so easy to make mistakes there. And so another challenge, I briefly mentioned the word causation. Um, it's hard to discover all possible natural causes for any geological phenomenon. You know, we, we try, and as scientists, and I'm not a scientist, by the way, I've been trained more in theology, but as scientists we try and look at all spot possible causes and then uh, eliminate the least probable causes until we can narrow it down to one or two or three most likely causes. Well, there's a problem in the natural world because we, um, we tend to go from the present into the past. And the present doesn't provide enough causes to explain the past, right? Just look at the uh, meteorite hypothesis for killing off the dinosaurs. Just this week, a new article came out. I haven't read the article, I've read the news reports. And now they're saying that all of the major damage of the meteorite hitting north of Yucatan Peninsula, all of it happened in 24 hours. That's the first time I've seen you know, that in there. And it's catastrophism at its ultimate. And so I'm anxious to study that a little further. But we don't have giant meteorite impacts now. So those are some of the challenges. And when you throw in non-natural, supernatural challenge, uh, causation, then you really complicate the picture. And that's not illegitimate either, I'm suggesting. So here's the geological column. I think we've had, um, we've had pictures on the screen before showing the rock formations. And starting down here at the bottom, the Cambrian, the uh, first major formation with complex fossils, and then we uh, organize life according to, I guess you could say complexity. Uh, the Paleozoic uh, would be the bottom formations. That's in blue on the left. Then Mesozoic is green, and then Cenozoic yellow. So those are the three major, and I want you to concentrate on the three major and not worry too much about knowing the geological column. You don't have to know the column to appreciate what I'm going to talk about. The six formations plus one, we're not covering Yellowstone this week, but the six formations there are on the right side. And you can see they're scattered all through the uh, geological column. Actually, next week we study uh, 
we're going to look at Gilboa very briefly. Um, and there's one formation that I couldn't get in at the top, and that's uh, at the very top in what's called the Neogene up there, or Miocene. That's the uh, fossil forest from Germany. We're going to end on that, some fascinating forests there. So here's the outline. Jungar is a deep valley in southwest China. Good. That came out OK. Yeah. This you may recognize if you had a chance to read uh, the handout last week or if you went to the website and read the, uh, the uh, online paper for today. By the way, I'll give you references at the end, so uh, you can copy them down and find out where I've published. But I want you to concentrate on these uh, wonderful, I think, wonderful illustrations. Here's a two-dimensional view. We start at the easiest possible, the map view, the bird's eye view, looking down at these fossil trees with their roots spread out like legs of a spider spreading out in all directions. What's the first thing that you notice, kind of obvious? Well, you've got four stumps lined up, and that could happen by chance. So we're dealing with the issue, uh, is this totally random, by chance, catastrophic, or is there some kind of design to the way these trees are arranged. And I'm looking for design because the highest level of design would indicate probably that a fossil forest is where it originally grew. You're going to hear more about that in a minute. So I could put dotted dashed lines there and line up all these trees. They line up very nicely not only according to direction, but according to size. I don't think you can uh, see it too well. Well, yeah, can you read that? Uh, here's a pretty big tree, two and a half meters diameter. Here's one not quite as big, 2.2 meters. Wow, that's what, seven feet diameter? Pretty big. And then you have all four of these in a row that hover around 2.1 or 2.2 meters in diameter. This is 2.1, this is 2.134, and so on. And the standard deviation there is 2.157, or rounded off to 2.15. And as some of you can resurrect your math knowledge from the past, standard deviation is important. It, it shows whether there is a rela good relationship between objects or not a good relation. These are highly oriented according to size. Now, causation. I mentioned it's hard to come up with causation. Yes, doctor, do you have a thought? We can pack some mic around. It's not too early. By the way, I encourage you as we go along as you find something that might be relevant. Up in uh, the Arrowhead area, and he was looking at the different trees in his area and noted on the hillside that there would be a group of trees in a line that were taller than any of the trees on either side. And he wondered if they were getting more water. So he took and had a drilling company come in and drill into the hillside a slanted I didn't want to pipe. It. And this slanted pipe was had the holes in it and it was slanted upward. And then all of a sudden out of this pipe, because it was a well drilling company, it gushed tremendous amount of water. And they then did the things to put on the special fittings and put a uh, clamp on it. And when the Arrowhead Water Company had trouble with one of the dry spells, they then rented water from him and brought their trucks over to him, filled their trucks with water, then took it back to their company 
to process the water. And it was fascinating that all these trees that were extra tall were in a straight line going up that hill. And he had three different places where he had finally three different water lines in the hillside there, up there, and from the Arrowhead Lake, it's to the west, and it overlooks those, that property, that hillside overlooks that new lake that they created up there when they dammed the hillside and made that new, new lake up there. It's on that southwest hillside is where those pieces of uh, pipe were in, went into the hillside overlooking that new lake. Okay, very good. Sorry, um, I hit the wrong button. We're uh, doing configurations. Yeah. Um, now, these are living trees, right? These are living what? trees. And they're all lined up. Yeah. Lined up in a row. Well, good. Let's discuss the slide I just looked. I don't know how to uh, cut off the updates. St up to 2%. <laughs> Um, let's talk about the fossil ones now. How would you get fossil trees, all approximately the same size, at least four of them, all lined up? Well, one way is through a fault. And I think that you said Lake Arrowhead up that direction. There's a lot of faulting and a lot of slipping and sliding. And trees love to look for faults. And they send the roots down. And that's where the water, groundwater tends to percolate through. So this could be a paleo flop, uh, fault that I just showed you. And we're not upgraded yet. I would like to suggest another scenario that I think is a little more likely, but I don't rule out faults, by the way. Uh, the other scenario, how many of you have been to the Pacific Northwest to some of the rainforests and you've seen huge trees, fallen logs, and so on. And you've seen trees growing out of a rotten log. The rotten log has been there for decades. And all of a sudden, you have a whole row of trees. That's called a nurse log. So it's raising little trees up, and they're all lined up in a row. I'm just wondering if we have a nurse log here. Uh, Doug wants to make a comment. Uh, what, what about a, just a stream? You know, there's a little valley and a stream that goes in somewhat of a straight line, and then trees love getting Well, if I know stream. anything about streams in the western U.S., uh, quite often they follow faults. So it wouldn't exclude the fault hypothesis. Well, but uh, in mountains, there's like little valleys, and water runs down the, the little valley. The other thing about vi there's valleys, you look at the... Uh, San Juan River and the Goosenecks, my, the streams just, they meander all over the place. They're not very straight. I'm from Michigan. I've spent most of my life there, and that's where I'll be moving in a few weeks. And uh, even the streams that I know of, I've canoed many of them. You keep going around curves and, you know, on long canoe trips, and they're never straight. So it depends on whether it's flat ground, like you know, like uh, the Colorado River, for example, pretty yeah, flat. Yeah, flat would be uh, if meandering. if it's hilly, in which case you have some elevation, and, and those streams are not, uh, you know, serpentine. Uh, some of you can speak more directly to the hill part here in the western U.S. I apologize for this. I don't know how to get out of the updates other than totally rebooting. <laughs> you might have to start all over again at that point. Yeah, okay. Um, I will make one observation that's interesting, is that um, one of the trees, the bottom tree, has a long um, uh, root yeah. that seems to follow, a, assuming it was a nurse log or perhaps assuming that it was a fault, either one. Uh, the line that the other three trees are lined up with. But one thing I was struck by is that none of the other trees seem to do that. And no, it's a they little don't. bit on the odd side. Yeah. Just the one root, that's all. Do you know how long that one root is? 12.5 meters, which is a little less feet? than 40 feet yeah. long. 
one of the things that I'm discovering with fossil trees is that uh, if they're transported, most of the time the roots are broken off. Occasionally you get a root that's sticking out of ways. But to get something that long, not sheared off with a force of uprooting, that's highly unusual. This is the only tree I know in the fossil record that would have a root going almost 40 meters. Yeah, okay. You, you started at the beginning saying that you were looking for design. I now, am how would this. It, how would a trees lining up with a fault fit design? Um, design can be based on how something is uh, measured against present conditions. So you're using a little bit of uniformitarian logic. And if presently you have a well-functioning forest and everything is arranged in a certain order in order to the forest to re replenish and keep growing, um, to me, that's an evidence of design, rather than God planted it there. <laughs> so would you say that design is is the same as effect? Well, yeah, design is the final effect of what you see. But Okay, uh, I see yeah. what you mean. All right. Okay. It says that uh, the updates are complete. Um, now... Let's think of one more thing. I, I do my best to try and think of a worldwide cataclysmic explanation for this forest. We always go, that's our first default on any aspect of geology as creationists. And I'm thinking, yeah, maybe you could get a flood washing in a nurse log with trees growing up right on top of it, and it comes to, uh, it lands on a high-rise part of the post-diluvian world, and then they take root again and start growing again. Uh, you have to come up with something like that to explain it. Now, next week I'm going to show you that there are creationists that say, that formation that I've just described is a product of the flood. It was buried by the flood. And one is a very prominent person, Timothy Clary, who's with uh, Institute of Recreation Research. I still might have to reboot because uh, it doesn't. I have a slow laptop. I think I'll go back and reboot. It's going to reboot anyway. So next week I'll explain how you might be able to put that into a flood model. Now, flood model, you have currents of water. And you have, my next slide was supposed to show the direction of currents at the fossil forest in Jungar Basin, China. And that's important. You know, our Chadwick has spent half of a lifetime just looking at directions of currents in the fossil record. That's very important to us as creationists. Um, you look at the fossil logs at this particular site, and they're all basically lined up, 90% of them, east-west direction. So they are, that's designed, by the way. It's a cataclysm that's lining them up in a design effect so they're not just random piles and heaps of logs. Mm -hmm. Okay. My computer will complain when it wants to. Oh, my. It didn't go all the way off. I know how to get it off. Unplug it. The battery is dead on this, so when I unplug it and go to battery, then it goes off immediately. So then I go, this is the problem with something that's an antique. <laughs> but 
it gives us a chance to explore possibilities with this site. Now, the trees that are lined up four in a row, the paleo direction or the present direction is 50 degrees east of north. And that's almost uh, in a northeast direction, almost purely northeast. They're not lined up east-west like all the fallen logs in the same forest. I think there are 15 fallen logs they found there. And I'm only showing about half that number, maybe seven upright logs. And so there's a mismatch there. And if we have a cataclysm that um, buried those, then it would be uh, it would be unnatural for it to end up this way. I am rebooting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Another thing I was going to bring up: you have to look at things three dimensionally. What I'm showing you is two dimensional. A little bit of three-dimensional because the uh, the trees, the stumps are sticking up sometimes four or five feet high. They're almost as tall as a, a man, and I have pictures, but I didn't bring them. Uh, the third dimension is to look at surrounding rocks, and down below the trees is a stream valley, paleo. They call it a paleo stream valley. And to go along with what Doug was asking about, is it straight or is it curved? So this is a curved stream valley that they think is a paleo stream valley just below this forest. That was my next slide. Yeah. Okay. We're making progress. We're making good progress now, finally. Thank you for your patience, by the way. Good luck, you got it. Hey. Well, thanks to my friend Paul here. <laughs> Man of the hour. <laughs> yeah. This one doesn't work, that's right. Okay. To Let's advance the screen. Um, just push, up and down. Uh, either, yeah. yeah, up and up down, and down. Or, or forward and backwards, it doesn't matter. Either one will work. Take this because it doesn't. Just to remind you where we're at geologically, we're probably, you'll get the lights there. We're probably pretty low down here. Jungar. That's Jurassic. Well, it's in the upper half of the geological column, but that's Jurassic. Keep going. Don't worry about me. I'm oh, I don't need oh, that. That's Here's right, power. Yours, yeah. That's your power. Okay. That one works and the other one doesn't. That's fine. Okay. Go for it. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts about having the alignment? You know? I would like to say that the flood washed it in, but you've got to have probably a, a nurse log or something floating it in. And there's a lot of creationist thought today about logs transporting animals after the flood so that they can settle around the earth. I'll talk about that next week. Okay, my paper online has 16 criteria for determining whether something is in situ. In situ means in the place or in the site of growth. It's Latin. Wherever it grew, that's where it ended up uh, as its deathbed. So here's number eight up here. If roots radiate out from the upright stump in all directions without clear evidence of being broken off or truncated, the stumps are more likely to be autochthonous, another big word, which means also the same thing as in situ. Um, things have not been washed far, but they've been preserved where they grew, autochthonous. That's probably the only time you'll see that. Um, that one criteria about um, roots not truncated, uh, the weathering has truncated this root, 
but the rest of the root is out there. So I would count that as not being truncated. That's a place in northern uh, Canada on a lonely island, and the wood there is so fresh that you can burn it. It's not been fossilized. I hope to bring some of that next week, too. And that would be um, the same age as Yellowstone Fossil Forest, Eocene, for those that want the geological age. And here you have, like that root comes clear out here. Weathering has broken it off, but generally we would say this dump looks like it's in C2, but we need to look more closely. And so the next scene we're looking at is the paleo stream bed that they've reconstructed. They've actually dug and drilled and so on. And they have a profile of the stream bed. And it fits modern streams, the cross-section profile. So it looks like it's a stream. Now, you could put that in the flood as well. Uh, especially when you find zero upright stumps. Keep in mind, this is the next level down. We're, I don't know, 20 or 30 or 40 feet below the stumps. Here's where the two, four, six, eight stumps. There are eight upright stumps there. And then you have a stream bed coming out. And they can actually find the direction of the flow of the water because see how the logs line up with directional flow. So what do we conclude about this? I think we've exhausted that topic. Oh. I would like to summarize all 16 criteria that I have in my paper in just one. Fossil forests exhibiting the highest level of design and organization. That's probably a better word, Gary, than uh, design, organization. Things that look like they're highly arranged. They're more likely to have grown in place where buried. Not necessarily proving it, but more likely. Fossil forests exhibiting chaos and randomness in arrangement are more likely to have been transported in from another location. So let's go to the closest fossil forest that I know of. Closest big one is in Arizona, Petrified Forest National Park. One of the criteria that I used is from Clary, Timothy Clary, right here. Um, he's with ICR, as I mentioned. He's the one that suggests that most fossil forests uh, were transported in by Noah's flood, but he's found one forest that he feels was not. And I'll also discuss that next week. He says, finding multiple single species trees spaced in growth position in the same horizontal plane, nearly equidistantly, equal distant from each other, in all directions from the trunks, and not merely random space. Now, random space is very subjective. You know, one person will say it looks random, others will say it looks designed. So in my next slide is from Petrified National uh, Forest, Arizona, in the northeast corner of Arizona. It's from the Chinle Formation. Chinle is a formation that our own Dr. Roth can be driving along, he can immediately recognize it and name it all up and down the western U.S. And this formation is in Nevada, covers most of Nevada, Utah, and some of Arizona, some of New Mexico, and some of Colorado. So it's huge, widespread. And it has one layer, Shinarump, the one layer that has just tons, literally tons, of fossil wood. Uh, most rock shops have fossil wood from that formation. Most of that fossil wood, probably 99.9% .9 of it, is from trees or logs that are prone. They're not upright. 
this is the only place I could find in the whole western U.S. where you seem to have a little grove of upright trees in this Chinle formation. And it's right in Petrified Forest National Park. Now, applying criteria one, if they're spaced equidistantly and supposedly non-random in their spacing, then it's more, more likely in situ. Uh, so we're, again, we're looking down at the top. We're on a little mesa. It's been eroded. This whole area has been eroded out. It's lower down. But it's on a little mesa. And what do you have? A couple dozen trees there. Look like non-random spacing. Now, you can always argue, no, they're, they're not equally spaced. There are clumps. They come in twos. There are several pairs of trees that are next to each other. Well, that's no different than modern sequoias. By the way, these are either a sequoia tree or a relative, like meta sequoia, of the modern sequoia. If you go to um, Florissant, which will be discussed next week, you'll see three stumps in a circle, and they're described as coming out, growing out from the base of a redwood tree. So that redwood tree becomes like an upright nurse log, and these three trees grew up after the tree in the middle uh, rotted away. Well, you say, where's the rotted part? It's gone. <laughs> so we can't prove it. These are described as three clone trees. They're approximately the same size, and they probably grow out. Um, just... Uh, was it one week ago? Yeah, last Sunday I was with our daughter. A week ago Sunday I was with our daughter in uh, northern uh, California, and we went in the redwood forest. And sure enough, I could find good-sized trees grow growing out sideways right from the base of a redwood stump. You've all seen that if you've walked through redwood forests. So what we're looking at here are um, maybe nurse logs and trees growing out from the base of another tree. There are other things that we could point out that uh, suggest this is probably in C2. Can't prove it, but probably. Especially in light of the fact if 99.9% .9 of all the logs over hundreds and hundreds of square miles are all laid flat, and this is the one area where they are growing upright. It looks like they're growing there, maybe after the flood. Uh, that's what we have to look at. If it's before the flood, if it's before the flood, we have a real big problem because these are Triassic. And below the Triassic, you have the whole Paleozoic. You would have to put the whole Grand Canyon before the flood if these trees in, uh, in this little mesa called Blue Mesa are growing in place. We're going to take just uh, maybe five, seven more minutes. We have a question or a thought. Yeah. Looking back at the mesa, yeah. it looks like there's three, three groups of Let's trees. Let's go back to it. Three groups of trees. The, the one at the top and, yeah. the one, and the left upper and then the left lower that are almost in straight lines suggesting that you might have three nurse logs yeah. uh, for those three formations. Good point. Uh, Jack Stout, Dr. Stout wanted to say something right here. Do you ever in a modern forest see trees growing that closely together? Your, uh, your actually, on that's the left. not very close. Look at the scale here, 20 meters. So you're talking about 65 feet for that, and these are 5 to 10 meters apart. No, no, I'm looking at on the left side. Oh, yeah. Like there. Right there, to your right. I mean, that, that Any of overlap these. seems... These would be uh, nurse log trees or nurse trees. And they could survive blowing that close oh, to yes. each other. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You see it in any uh, western forest. 
If, if I may You've been ask, in the East long, too long, Jack. <laughs> if I may ask, uh, they're drawn as circles. Yeah. Is, it's not the circles, scale. the sky? Okay. There's and, no scale. And um, so those might be stumps that are actually quite a bit smaller than... Yeah, than the size will vary. None of these are the same size. I have some more uh, plain views, uh, two-dimensional views of forests where you do have size. We need to uh, move along. We have tidal cycles in southern Indiana. Um, I'm going to probably have to just race through that um, because I can't do it justice even in five minutes. Uh, Dr. Brand's been there. Dr. Roth, have you been to southern Indiana? I think you have been. Dr. Coffin was there. Uh, some of the geoscience people have been there. And Art Chadwick was there. And uh, that merits a whole study in itself. But the thing that, when we visited there in 1990, as I recall, the thing we didn't know about was whether you actually had growth into the tidal cycles. Tidal cycles are laminated sediments supposed to represent the fluctuations of tides. And if you have roots growing into the laminations, then the tidal cycles were formed first, and then you had growth later, and the growth would take more than a few weeks, maybe a few months, or however long it would take. And these are extinct trees. Here's the bark of um, Lepidodendron tree. I have bark right here. You can see it afterwards. And uh, isn't that beautiful? Talk about design. That is highly designed. Uh, lepido is the word that uh, in Latin or Greek means scale. So these are scale trees. Where did they get the idea of scales? Well, maybe from fish or reptiles or butterfly wings. The pattern of butterfly wings is preserved here in tree bark. This is the impression of the outermost bark. In fossil forests, 95% of the time, probably 99% of the time, the bark is missing. It's been ground off, which is an evidence for transport, most likely, or else a lot of catastrophism that comes sweeping through a forest, and like at uh, Mount St. Helens, it came sweeping through some of the forests, and the trees were left rooted there, but all the bark is gone because of the mud flows. Well, here the bark is retained. It's the bark impression. This is not the bark itself. It's the impression in the surrounding rock. Here's the rooted zone that is probably the most controversial part. And if, if these tidal cycles are really caused by tides and these thin laminations, they're only a few centimeters, I mean millimeters, maybe four to 10 millimeters in thickness. If these are genuine tidal laminations, then you seem to have growth of roots coming down. There's a root, there's a root coming and look at the laminations. They're perfectly, perfectly horizontal. They're not bent. The roots coming down are not bending the cycles very much, maybe a little bit. Up at the top is the source of the root, and that's a, well, that's the root itself, the primary root. These are secondary. They're often called rootlets. The plant is called stigmaria, which now is associated with lepidodendron. These are fossil scale trees, the lycopods trees. They're totally extinct. And you seem to have some growth. This is in my paper, and I discuss it. And then the next one actually shows the uh, rootlets coming down. Here's the, uh, it's like a horizontal branch, underground branch of a root and then you have all these rootlets coming down. And right down here, that's all tidal cycles. And you have about 25 to 30 feet of tidal cycles. And then you're on top of a coal bed. 
and the coal bed has some upright stumps of trees, not very many. But I'm trying to paint a picture of what you would see if you were to go there today. Sorry, we don't have time to discuss that right now, but maybe in a couple minutes. So a criteria I'm suggesting, number 11 in my paper, is the identification of delicate roots and rootlets having penetrated laminated sediments. That seems to indicate um, uh, growth after uh, the tidal cycles were laid down. The cycles can be graphed with thickness. Here's a graph. Each bar is a different lamina. Lamina has two parts, a dark part and a light part. Um, and there are two tides a day, so you could count days here. Pair the dark one with the hatched one, the dark with the hatched. That would be two days' time, theoretically, if we're interpreting correctly. And so you have 28 days here uh, from this one rock sample that's about 3.5 inches high. Uh, this is a vertical cross-section that I found lying in the surface of the quarry. Uh, usually you can't dig it out. You would destroy it. But this one Mother Nature provided for me. And that's that one sample took uh, if we're interpreting correctly, 28 days to form. Okay, our last two slides, and we'll be done in about two minutes, are based on this criteria, finding multiple single species trees spaced in growth position in the same horizontal plane. So that's two-dimensional, multiple, lots of upright trees. It's talking about upright trees single species spaced nearly equidistantly in all directions. We've stressed that before. That's uh, Clary's criteria one. And he applies it to a fossil forest, a lycopod forest in Glasgow. One of the oldest and most famous fossil forests is from a city park now in Glasgow. And he believes that that grew before the flood, and the flood then buried it at the time of the flood, preserving it. We'll present his view on that next time. Using his criterion, number one, which is his most important criterion, we can go to Argentina, and you have, I think, uh, how many trees? There are 150, maybe. I think there's 150 trees, and they're all numbered here. They're in clusters, and you have subgroups. Each little circle subgroup has the same size trees. Some of the subgroups have mature trees, some of them uh, less than mature, some of them new forest growth. And you have all those clusters preserved in the fossil record. This is a quarry at an open pit mine in Argentina. The scale here is, I think, 100 meters. So this is, uh, if I remember right, it's um, over 600 <coughs> feet long, if you want feet. Yeah, the scale is 100 meters there. So it would be, it would be more like 900 to 1,000 feet long, you know, probably. So it would be 300 meters long. So another forest, this is in Mongolia, it looks like desert. It is, the Gobi Desert. Not even a rabbit could survive there today. <laughs> this is where they found uh, whole clusters of dinosaur eggs. Uh, some of the first, quotes, nests of dinosaur eggs, Gobi Desert. That same area of Mongolia has one of the most famous fossil forests, and the numbers there, you can't see them, but maybe in the article you can blow it up and see the actual numbers. That, that indicates the size of each stump. Remember I said size is important. We couldn't do it with the Arizona one. But size is very important. And they all cluster around 110 to 120 
up here is 120 centimeters, which is a little over a meter. So we're talking about uh, three to four feet maximum, and most of them are at least 50 centimeters, half a meter in diameter. So you have a whole forest of trees that are much alike. The forest probably started about the same time, and it was wiped out probably almost instantly by some catastrophe, wiped out at the same time. Um, the previous one, I didn't mention this one. There's only one species of tree there. Charistosperm is a seed fern, giant seed fern. It's more than a fern, it's a tree. The one in Mongolia is um, composed of various trees. Uh, none of the trees there or in the other one are angiosperms, trees that you would find growing today commonly, like oaks and maples and all the uh, different angiosperm trees. They would be conifer trees. So that's uh, kind of interesting. Well, we have to end real quick. The conclusion is that best candidates for genuine fossil forests are in the Jungara Basin, China, the Lycopod Fossil Forest with the highly preserved trees there. Couldn't have been transported very far without removing all the bark. And why are they most likely in situ? Well, they have the highest levels of design found in any known forest uh, in the fossil record. Let's have a discussion now. For those that can stay, you're welcome to leave now, and you can get some of this on the Internet. By the way, is our discussion usually on the Internet, too? Yes, it is. It is. That's what I thought. So you'll be able to get in on it. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Mm -hmm. A quick question. Are there any uh, uh, tidal cycles that go more than 28 days? There's one deposit. Uh, it'll go every 28 days, which is the lunar cycle, by the way. It'll do that for up to what they think is six years up to six years. Six years worth of 28 yeah, days. Yeah, and that's in about seven meters. Six years and seven meters of deposition, which that is a galloping speed uh, geologically. You know, usually you think of maybe um, 10 centimeters or less uh, taking a thousand years or more. This is Phenomenal uh, deposition. Uh, and do you know in those uh, uh, in those six years it's twenty eight days? And and where is it in the geologic column? That's the other question. Yeah, I didn't bring that out to emphasize. That would be Pennsylvanian. Pennsylvania. Yeah. The reason I ask it's is up because here, Pennsylvania because. Uh, I'm, I would have to take that with a grain of salt if the, if, the, if the data are as presented. And the reason why is because, according to standard theory, the Earth, uh, the moon at one point was closer to the Earth. Exactly. And the Earth was revolving faster, yeah. which means that I would be very much surprised to see 28-day cycles. I would be much more inclined to see something like 35 or 40 day cycles. And uh, if people are interpreting that as 28 days, um, then I would call that interpretation into question. Good uh, point. And uh, the other thing is that as I was looking at that 28 days that you had up there, it did not look like uh, you should see two sets of small tides if that's the case. Yeah. I and think there's only of, one set. Part of that, that fossil was un incomplete. It, I think if I had a couple more laminations, it could have shown 
two sets. Um, yeah, you really, you really yeah. need those in order to. But it's in the literature. Uh, I'm, the I'm literature not saying has, that. It, yeah. um, as you mentioned early on, the fact that it's peer reviewed does not make it gospel. Exactly. <laughs> uh, while we're here, and you want to get references, you'll see them on the screen. Uh, let's comment a little more. Paul, you've raised some very good points on paleoastronomy and distance of the moon versus the earth. The scientists who started working on this in the year 1990, that was the year that, well, actually they started in 1989, and I was in southern Indiana, and I actually went out with the, in the field with the discoverer of these tidal cycles. So I had lots of time to ask questions. He had an astronomer friend from Indiana University, and they were trying to mm -hmm. decipher um, how far the moon was from the Earth based on this, with the presupposition that this represents 350 million years ago. See, Paleozoic, approximately. I don't know the exact date they came up with. And so they were unable to find paleo cycles that would match with uh, the theory of the Earth, uh, the moon being joined originally with the Earth and splitting off. They couldn't prove that. And so you never, you haven't found a published article on that. At least I haven't. They wanted to. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Zippert. On that uh, tidal cycle diagram that you have, the, the one that is the hatch marks so one, one set show a hatch mark, and then the other are the straight lines that yeah. are the solid lines. Do those represent a different pattern of flow between the one and the other? Is the one flow going like to the east and the other flow going to the west they're, or that type of they're a... both uh, uni, unidirectional. Both flows are unidirectional, like modern times. Uh, if you read some of the original scientific papers on this, they find the best modern analog is in Indonesia. Sulawesi, one of the islands of Indonesia, Sulawesi. And uh, they're saying that these kind of tides usually uh, represent the equator. The location is equatorial. Now, southern Indiana, equator, <laughs> There's a mismatch there, unless you have major crustal movements of the Earth. So there again, you can have catastrophism. See, you would have catastrophe. But okay, to explain the hatch mark ones, if you go from hatch mark to hatch mark all the way across, these are the lesser tides. And then all of a sudden, there's a reversal right here. It's a crossover. And then the lesser tides become the major tides. And that happens cycle after cycle after cycle. So lesser to major to lesser. That fits modern tides. Why? Because for 14 days of the lunar month, 14 and a half days, let's say, the moon with respect to the Earth is in one position reference to the equator. And then the next 14 days, it's in another position reference to the equator because the Earth is constantly at an angle, the tilt. And so if you put the moon out here at times, it'll be more over the northern hemisphere. And then if you put the moon over here, it'll be more over the southern hemisphere. And there will be greater or lesser tides as a result. And then your crossover point is where the moon is right on the plane right. between exactly. the, the ang angulation. You're good at three-dimensional thinking. That's, I have a hard time. A lot of people have not been able to wrap their minds around that. But the crossover is when you have two tides equal, and the moon's position then theoretically would have been right over the equator at that point then what we should have seen at that point is to see 
uh, it coming back in, at about at, day 29, 20, 30, yeah, more like 29, 35 30. In, in, in the standard theory, and then exactly uh, coming back. Um, it does come yeah, back. And it's too bad because we only have this one cycle. I, yeah, I would have yeah. loved to have seen them draw it for a, two or three cycles so that you can see I know where you over. can see it. You have to go to the Indiana Geological Survey. It's a shelf document. It's um, proprietary information. They haven't published it. But if you go in as a researcher, they can lay out the whole thing. I haven't done that. But I'd um, like to. Where in Indiana is this? So that's at Bloomington, the campus of Indiana University. Because I'll, I'll be going, actually, I'll be going to Bloomington in, uh, uh, well, just before October 23 and 24. Really? Well, let's keep in touch. It'd be well worth exploring. I'll, I'll, I'll find that fascinating. Yeah. Oh, it is. Yeah. Bring the pictures. Um, I don't know if they'll allow me to do that or not, but uh, if I can, I will. Bring as much data as you can. It would be helpful. Yeah. Okay. Um, you can tell the challenges. I have to admit that I would love to put most or all of this into a one-year event. That's been my lifelong challenge and goal, put it all in one year. There are little parts here and there that are hard to fit into that puzzle. It's a humbling experience. I say, Lord, you're greater than I am. Your mind is greater. I have to trust where I can't understand. Good note to end on. Thank you. Come up and see my samples, and next week I'll bring the journals that have some of the articles I've been talking about.